My name is John Penny. I'm an associate professor at Oscott Hall Law School, and I'm very pleased to chair this final plenary um, conversation. And we've got a great um, panel on point. We're going to be talking about scrutinizing the Supreme Court with digital technology, right? This case, so this conference has been really an exercise in scrutinizing the Supreme Court and its practices, its decision-making on a number of different bases, doctrinally, statutory interpretation, new and innovative ways of analyzing, but you know, technology really is, uh, provides new and powerful means of analyzing the Supreme Court and its practices. Machine learning technology, artificial intelligence, new forms of statistical analysis are providing a powerful way of understanding the Supreme Court's practice and decision-making. But of course, along with those new powerful ways of analyzing and understanding come implications, normative, ethical, legal, governance, all of that. And that's gonna be part of our conversation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Paul Eric Veal from Lengstners, who will be speaking uh, to uh, some new ways of analyzing uh, decision-making. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Um, so I, I uh, am a litigator at Lancer Slat here in Toronto, and um, like all good litigators, I know to um, avoid the difficult questions when they come. So I will just um, give the caveat that unfortunately I've been ordered into a case conference at five o'clock today, so I have to leave before the Q&A period. So, um, and, and probably the second Jenna starts talking about my paper, I will also say, oh, sorry, got to leave right now. Um, uh, so I apologize in advance for that. but. Just to sort of give a little bit of background on what it is that we've done and what animates the paper, uh, the draft paper that I have. And because I'm a practicing lawyer, I've always, I've always had a very practical interest in the data analytics that we do. It has been a question of um, how can we collect data to give better insights to our clients? And it, uh, people usually talk about technological improvement as getting one of the sort of better, faster, cheaper. Um, I've really been interested in the better part. That is, we all have the insights about what our adjudicators will do from our experience practicing as lawyers, but are there insights that we're missing when we're using sort of the, the power of the narrative and the close case analysis? Are there broader patterns that we miss when we don't look at the data on a more systematic level? And so that's what initially motivated me into this space. And what that's led to is that we now sit on um, a series of, of, of data sets about cases. And by series of data sets, I don't mean sort of the chat GPT style, massive large language models. I mean, metadata about cases. So our Supreme Court of Canada leave project, which I'll speak about, and um, that is a database of every Supreme Court of Canada leave application decision from January 1st, 2018 to the present with um, I, we're constantly adding data to it, but at this point, it probably has 60 or 70 data points that we collect about every decision, information about the parties, information about what happened at the lower court, information about um, the lawyers seeking leave, information about obviously the disposition, information about how long it took to go from leave application to decision, um, all of those information, obviously, about the subject matter of the of the issues in the case, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the paper that I prepared that I'm going to speak about today is about um, looking at a subset of that data, so leave applications in constitutional cases. And what I'll talk about primarily is three things very quickly. First, why we care about this in the leave application context, which I've touched on a little bit. Second, substantively, what we learn from the data that we have. And third, where we go from here, and I'll touch a little bit on um, why we both the, sort of the promises and perils of this type of analysis. So first off, why do we care about this? What can this add? In the leave application context, I think there's a huge capacity for data analytics to give us insights that we don't otherwise have. Why do I say that? So first off, the Supreme Court leave process is sort of unique in the sense that the conventional legal tools that we all use all the time fall completely flat. Why? Because we don't get reasons as to why the Supreme Court of Canada does or doesn't release 
a, uh, a, a does or doesn't decide to grant leave to a particular case. So that means that we're left guessing about what the Supreme Court is doing in any particular case. And the usual close textual reading and trying to fit precedents together just doesn't really work. We're instead just looking for patterns. And when you're looking for patterns, that's exactly the type of situation when data sets and statistical analysis can help with those. And the other reason why I think it's important to look at the sort of the leave application process is um, I, I think it's massively understudied. There's only a handful of papers out there studying the leave process in any meaningful depth. It's, it's, it's sort of discussed in passing a lot, but you know, the leave application, uh, while the Supreme Court's decisions are the decisions that push the law forward, the leave process is the process that decides where the law doesn't get pushed forward. And indeed, you know, in any given year, 90, 92, 93% of cases don't get leave. Even in constitutional cases, 85% of cases that raise a constitutional issue don't get leave. And as I'll talk, even in constitutional cases where there isn't a self-represented applicant sort of advancing an out there argument, which was never going to get leave anyways, you know, even 75 to 80% of those cases don't get leave. So, there's lots of cases the Supreme Court isn't hearing, and it's very important to understand why and scrutinize um, um, whether that makes sense, whether it should be doing anything differently. Um, and from my perspective, um, that's sort of the, 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 the perspective that a lot of people in this room might care about. It. My perspective is a much more practical one. It's, is it worth bringing a leave application in this case? Um, is this the type of case where, you know, Maybe it's going to cost $5,000. Maybe it's going to cost $10,000. Maybe it's going to cost $20,000. Whatever dollar amount of leave application costs, if I've got a good basis to say this is a hopeless case, you shouldn't bring the leave application, um, I should save my clients money. I think I have an ethical obligation to try and save their money if it's a hopeless leave application. So if I can reach that conclusion earlier on in the process, all the better. So that's why I think it's very, this is an area sort of low hanging fruit where data analytics can tell us some things about the process. So that's sort of the pitch as to why I think it's important. What does the data show? So I outline it in my, in my uh, draft paper. I won't go through all of it, but um, uh, um, sort of a number of things that are a bit interesting and it depends on how you look at it as with so many things in the data. And that's of course what can make data dangerous. And, so the vast majority of cases, as I said, don't get leave, and that's true. The vast, even the vast majority of uh, cases raising a constitutional issue don't get leave. And there does, it seems to be easier to get leave in federalism cases than charter cases. And uh, even when you remove self-represented litigants, self-represented applicants from the pool of cases, and I remove them from the pool because in the last five years, there has not once been a single case where a self-represented applicant got leave to the Supreme Court of Canada. So it's sort of helpful to take them out of the pool, even taking them out of the pool. And about 15% of cases that raise a charter issue get leave, about 23% of cases raising a federalism issue get leave. And so still not massively different. And so it is true that constitutional cases, unsurprisingly, get leave more often than other types of cases, but not quite as often as you might uh, think coming into it. But the interesting analysis isn't sort of looking at sort of basic descriptive statistics like that. The interesting analysis is, well, how many factors can we put into a model and sort of see what things drive the results of leave application uh, uh, decisions. And that's the sort of the first model I present in the paper without getting too technical. And um, there's a sort of very old statistical technique called a logistic regression, which effectively allows you to throw a bunch of independent variables into a model and sort of determine what the average impact of some particular factor is on the probability of some event occurring, to put it relatively simply. And um, and when you do that with the data we have, you can see some very clear patterns uh, that come out of uh, the data as to which types of cases do and don't get leave. And so the top line results of that are, and most of these won't be surprising, they confirm the intuitions that a lot of us will know, but if there is a dissent at the Court of Appeal, that massively, massively increases the chances of getting leave, no surprise there. 
If the applicant is either the federal or provincial government, as opposed to someone challenging legislation, government applicants get leave massively more often, um, unsurprisingly. Um, the Court of Appeal having allowed an appeal, so having reversed the lower court's decision, also massively increases the chances of getting leave. Again, unsurprising, because that signifies some degree of judicial disagreement, right? If you've got three judges disagreeing with one, that's a measure of disagreement. Um, and interestingly, although there's very few of these, the presence of a concurring decision at the Court of Appeal also increases the chances of getting leave. I'm always a little bit surprised by that one because you would have thought that's sort of an independent path to the same result, but maybe it just signifies judges only write concurrences when there's something important enough to write a concurrence about. So that's a good proxy for that. Um, let me tell you about a few things that didn't impact, at least in that model, the likelihood of getting leave. Um, uh, so, and some of these are genuinely surprising. So one of the things we collect in our data set overall um, is whether there was an intervener at the Court of Appeal, because the, in a case where an intervener decides to intervene at the Court of Appeal, that's probably because that case raises an issue of public importance because an intervener has self-selected into that. Um, across our entire data set of all cases, interventions are correlated with an increased likelihood of leave applications. In the subset of constitutional cases, there's no relationship that we could find between the presence of an intervener and the likelihood of getting leave. Uh, not quite sure why, I wanna look into that more, but it's an interesting result. Similarly, um, and this is an interesting one that I'll sort of flag in the remaining few minutes I have before I shut up. Um, across our data set as a whole, um, other measures of the complexity of the Court of Appeals decision are associated with an increased likelihood of getting leave. So across the entire data set, and I mean here not just constitutional cases, but the length of the Court of Appeals decision is positively associated with getting leave. The number of citations by the Court of Appeal is positively associated with getting leave. And the length of time between the date of argument and the date of decision is positively associated with getting leave. In constitutional cases across sort of the whole data set, we actually don't see any relationship between any of those three and the likelihood of getting leave. But, um, and this is where now I transition a little bit from sort of speaking about substance to speaking about methodology, which is that we have to be, um, I think it's important that we all become, and or that there at least is a subset of people in the academy that become data literate and do this kind of work and scrutinize this type of work and criticize one another's work in the way that, um, I'm not suggesting that we all become economists, but I think it would be nice if a subset of us became a little bit more like economists, because the conclusion that I just said told you that if we just use this one model, you don't see any association between those factors and the likelihood of getting leave. That's true. And that's a function of that model. That's a function of the fact that the model takes an average impact across the whole data set. Um, but it's what is actually the case using some other models is that you can see that some of those variables that our primary model told us weren't relevant are relevant across sort of subsets of the cases. So one of the other models I discussed in the paper is um, what's called a decision tree model, which is exactly like most of you have seen, a decision tree of this sort of branching different options and criteria and different outcomes that flow from those. And there are wonderful statistical algorithms that can take a data set with a bunch of different factors and partition it into different groups of data and tell you how to build a decision tree to sort of separate your data out um, most uh, most uh, uh, neatly to sort of uh, have the biggest bang for your buck. And when you do that on constitutional cases where leave is, uh, uh, is sought, you actually see that some of those factors that I said overall in the data set don't matter, do start mattering in subsets of cases. So for example, and, and I described this in the paper, but the single most important factor 
in this decision tree model for deciding whether or not you get leave is, is the applicant a government entity? No surprise there. If it's the provincial or federal government seeking leave, that's because there has been a constitutional violation found. Maybe a law has been struck down. Maybe it's just um, uh, just uh, a police uh, charter breach, some type of unconstitutional state action. Unsurprising that the court would choose to grant leave more often in those cases. But in the subset of cases where it's someone, um, an individual or a corporation seeking leave, so not a government body, going down that branch, if you're there, the single most important factor is the presence of a dissent. So if you're a non-government body, 44% of cases with a dissent get leave. If there's no dissent at the Court of Appeal, let's go further down that, decision length plays a huge uh, role. So, um, and these decision tree models split things up at arbitrary levels, but um, if you, under that, under that model, if you have a, de a decision that is longer, than, a Court of Appeal decision that is longer than 141 paragraphs, you have a 21% chance of getting leave. And if you have a decision that's less than 141 paragraphs, you have a 4.5% chance of getting leave. There's nothing magical to 141. I want to be clear, that model is... <laughs> Nothing magical happens. Those tree models are notoriously sensitive to particular, so, so don't, nothing magical about 141, please don't have that as the takeaway. But the takeaway I will say is um, uh, different factors can operate differently on different parts of the data. And the, the, all that to say is the data can give us massive value in understanding what the court's doing, predicting what the court's doing, all of that is true. We have to very carefully interrogate the, interrogate the data in different ways, lest we run, a, uh, run aground into a, a false conclusion. And the only way we can, well, one of the ways we can do that is I think just by producing more scholarship on this and having more people calling out the way, you know, trying to reproduce studies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm done. I think I'm gonna be metaphorically yanked off. Thanks very much for having me. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dash. Uh, and now uh, we have uh, Simon Wallace of Osgood who's going to be speaking to accessing law and audio with artificial intelligence. Thank you. And I do have a PowerPoint that'll come up. I'll, I'll stand because I have a, a teething one-year-old right now and I might fall asleep otherwise if uh, I can stand up. It's the other one. Yeah, perfect, thanks. So by the end of these remarks, I hope to do uh, one major thing, which is orient you to how I think it is that uh, this AI moment that we're living through is going to change your analyses, our analyses of law going forward. I have one particular argument, which is that probably most of us right now are overawed by uh, what we're seeing in the news or what we're seeing from chat GPT, and we're missing the most significant change the most significant contribution of AI uh, to law. Kind of randomly, the AI moment that we're living through uh, is all in the shadow of a 2017 discovery at Google. The uh, researchers in, in 2017 from Google released this paper called Attention is All You Need. And the argument of that paper was this sort of new algorithm design will improve machine translation. The discovery of that paper put sort of at a really high level is that this new algorithmic architecture can allow us to uh, translate data across different mediums. At the time, the discovery was we can move more effectively from one language to the other. But what we found over the years is that we can move across mediums really effectively. We can take information locked in images and get AI to transform it into uh, text. We can take an idea and say, take the same idea and represent it as a haiku, things like that. My argument to you is it's this translation of data across mediums that's going to really transform the study of law and the practice of law. You know, we often think when we see chat GPT, like, oh, this thing's gonna write decisions or something. I'm like, maybe, I don't know, I don't wanna make predictions. Uh, but what I do think, like the, the prediction I am comfortable in making is that we're going to be entering an era of really increased and more sort of impactful so what we're hearing, uh, empirical legal studies, because we're about to have so much more access to data. I hope to prove that by talking, uh, by reporting on a very particular uh, project that I'm working on uh, with audio. So we're used to working with case law, with statute, with transcripts. 
we're not so used to working with a uh, law that, uh, that people hear. We don't, as lawyers, as research, researchers, spend a lot of time thinking about what people say in court, uh, what judges say in court, the questions that they're asked, the order that people talk and the emotions that they bring to their voice. We don't think about um, you know, what, what happens in uh, police interviews because practically this information is just inaccessible to us. Uh, like you can listen to something, but it takes just as many hours uh, as the, the event in question. And the normal way that we access uh, audio is uh, using transcripts, which are notoriously expensive. You know, to uh, get a transcript, if you're a researcher or a lawyer, uh, if it's a, a full day hearing, this is gonna cost thousands of dollars uh, very quickly uh, and is gonna take a long time to produce. So my hypothesis is that there are a number of uh, recent AI technologies we can use as lawyers, as researchers, to better understand law, for lack of a better word, sort of like law lock, locked in the acoustic space. Functionally, AI, and this is what I'll show, is AI lets us produce transcripts which meet, maybe even exceed human quality, human produced transcripts and quality uh, much of the time. You know, it's not perfect. There's still things that we can uh, work on, but really in the past 10, 12 months, uh, there've been massive improvements in the technology, which I say will uh, change the way we do things. So for this study, uh, and like, here, here's the thing, it's like, I'm just like a dumb lawyer. But what I would, <laughs> thank you for laughing. <laughs> uh, what, uh, uh, but what I, I did is I, I wrote this open source program that did four things. It downloaded all the videos from the Supreme Court website, listened to each, uh, each one of those videos, and you see it in the, at the bottom of the screen there, and noticed when every time a speaker changed, that someone else started speaking. And then it broke up that audio and used a, a, a modern AI model to transcribe just what that speaker said. And then this part, which is also something interesting to speak about because it engages sort of concerns about surveillance. Uh, I then used uh, voice recognition and facial recognition software to identify each one of the, the judicial speakers. So here you see Justice Wagner start speaking at a uh, minute, two and 18 seconds and a, a picture of him. And I, I produced these transcripts for, uh, uh, for about two years worth of Supreme Court hearings. This in and of itself is I think a useful artifact uh, for researchers because it's much easier now to see what was said in the court. But it also means that we're able to do computational analyses of what, what is said in court. So for this study, uh, I narrowed it and I just looked at 51 videos uh, from the 2021 to 2022 term, uh, 2021 to 2022 SEC term, which is uh, 110 hours. And like, I don't have 110 hours to watch uh, videos. And then uh, asked three questions. So, and this is what I'll report on now. Which judge speaks the most? Uh, to what extent is the court bilingual? Uh, how often is it that, uh, that cases are actually, that both official languages are being heard in the case? And to what extent are each individual judges uh, using both official languages? I'll just preview the conclusions. There are significant gendered patterns to who's speaking, uh, which judges are speaking, and there's a huge bilingualism deficit in the court. Uh, judges appointed from Quebec are really the ones who are only speaking in French. Uh, at the court and uh, judges appointed not from Quebec are, are speaking very little in French. Just to orient you, uh, so over the term, almost a million words, uh, which is it's just under two editions of War and Peace. Uh, <laughs> and 22% uh, of all words that were issued during the, uh, the term were, uh, were uttered by, by judicial speakers. This information will become a bit more interesting later. Uh, of those cases, of those videos, 14 were civil matters, 37 criminal, and seven cases from Quebec courts. I importantly, all seven cases were criminal. And this is something that I'll return to, which may help us understand some of the, the patterns a little bit. So who speaks the most? Uh, Justice Maldaver uh, spoke uh, quite significantly uh, in, in the, the, the term. What will jump out to you, what jumped out to me is the, uh, the gendered patterns uh, of judicial speakers. Uh, judges who use he, him pronouns uh, speak much more often uh, than 
than, uh, um, than uh, judges that use she or pronouns. Uh, and generally, I'd say judges who have been on the court longer speak a bit more. A few things I can also sort of draw your attention to. Uh, Justice Wagner uh, is up there. He's actually generally a pretty quiet judge. It's sort of his chief justice duties uh, that push him uh, up a little bit higher, introducing everyone, uh, just managing the, the courtroom. Is that and then uh, his, uh, his participation in French language hearings. Similarly, Justice Moldaver's numbers are, are quite high, but then when he, when they sit, uh, quite often when they sat a panel of five, he was the president of the panel. Uh, so that accounts for uh, some of the uh, some of the reasons that his numbers are so high. You can see that uh, judges do have uh, different uh, interests. I've just broken it out here between criminal and civil. So you can see Justice Moldaver, you know, he's a known criminal law expert, speaks quite a bit more in criminal law hearings than civil. Justice Karakazanis doesn't speak all that much in criminal hearings, but does speak uh, a bit more in, uh, in uh, civil hearings. Uh, in terms of bilingualism at the court, uh, English is spoken you know, much more often, a rate of six and a half to one. Uh, you can see the numbers the, uh, there of the breakdown. This is across all judges, across all lawyers. French, though, is really only spoken generally speaking, when the uh, case is coming from Quebec. Uh, another way of saying this is that the language of intervention is English, uh, that when uh, uh, cases come up from other provinces, the, the language of the, uh, that the parties speak is English. Uh, and this you'll see in a second, uh, which I think is interesting, is there's really, there was no case in the data set where English and French even approached the same extent to which they were uh, being speaking. So, what is being spoken. So here you can see uh, the distribution of cases by percentage of English words. So at the far right, you see uh, all the cases between where all the words spoken were uh, English 90% of the time to 100% of the time. It accounts for a vast majority of the cases. And then at the left-hand side, you can see those cases where uh, French is spoken either 100% to about 35% of the time. So a very uneven distribution. Perhaps the most remarkable thing, though, is there's nothing in the middle, uh, just nothing there at all. What uh, this is perhaps the most startling finding is that uh, the francophone, the judges appointed from Quebec, really speak French much, much more often. Uh, in fact, Justice Caracas, for example, doesn't even show up. You know, a word of warning about like the the algorithm is not perfect uh, at all. So the, the one of the dangers of, uh, of sort of quantitative research is that uh, numbers look so exact they can appear very convincing. Uh, don't like take it all with a few grains of salt because it is it is an algorithm. The algorithm makes mistakes. And one particular way that the algorithm makes mistakes, which I find interesting, is that the uh, this the voice recognition algorithm really struggles. Uh, when people uh, speak in a different language than they're accustomed to, probably because they change the, the patterns of their speech, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but regardless, uh, what you can see here is uh, that the, the judges from Quebec speak a lot more when uh, there's a, uh, when French is the, the language uh, spoken. You can see all the transcripts on uh, this website I've, I've built called obiter.ai, where I'm sort of building an open source computational a suite of tools for, for lawyers. Bisonet might be the case to go look at because it's, I think, the most telling in this regard. What you'll see when you look at that transcript is uh, the, the parties litigate that case in French. And for the first half of that case, it's litigated exclusively in French. And with the, uh, all, and all the judicial interventions are by the uh, judges from Quebec. Justice Brown comes in uh, towards the end with one French language question, and then the interveners come in largely speaking English, and that's when the other judges get involved in that case and they engage with the interveners in English. That's a, a dynamic which is most evident in Bissonnette, but you'll see it in other cases as well. So uh, let me return to the conclusions. Uh, this sort of empirical analysis confirms, I think, what many of us would have suspected that there are uh, there are gendered patterns with uh, 
uh, how uh, uh, judges are participating in hearings, uh, and that there's a real bilingualism uh, deficit uh, at the court. Bilingualism, when it comes to uh, questions of appointments, is obviously something that we talk about quite a bit in this country. This finding sort of cuts two ways. I, either on the one hand, it can um, uh, maybe make us think that we need to have a higher threshold for what constitutes bilingualism uh, when we uh, think about appointments. On the other hand, bilingualism has often been used as a justification uh, not to make certain appointments. Uh, and maybe one of the findings here is that uh, bilingualism is not quite as important a uh, parameter in the sort of day-to-day -day practice of the court as we, uh, as we tend, to think of it, tend to think of it. Let me step back though and conclude with some uh, high level points. So uh, like the implications of this sort of technology are something I think we all need to reckon with. If I'm right that the most sort of significant uh, transformation brought by AI in the horizon to law, it's a, a, this access to more data, more information. I don't, I, like, as a lawyer, I don't feel that my career is threatened, uh, but it's definitely the case that there are a number of law adjacent, lawyer adjacent professions, which are gonna be directly impacted by this. Like, what does it mean that just me, uh, uh, as a guy, I'm able to build a, a transcriber which produces transcripts uh, at a fairly high quality in space, which it used to just be humans working. That's something we're going to have to think about. Cuts two ways. On the one hand, we should be worried about putting people out of work. On the other hand, there just aren't enough transcriptionists out there right now to do all the work that researchers and lawyers want them to do, particularly in the, the French language. How can the scholarly research law uh, of law, I like, it. you see, I was late when I wrote this, law and sound, it sounds like way cooler than I think it is. But uh, how can scholarly research of law and sound be advanced? It's one thing to do the Supreme Court. I'm excited about thinking about how we can use this technology to better understand what's happening at the tribunal level. Like, think about this uh, being uh, deployed in bail courts and uh, enabling that sort of uh, scholarly agenda. Uh, and probably there are ways for lawyers to be using uh, these tools to, to greater effect in their advocacy. At the same time, we need to be on guard for how these tools are fallible. I uh, identified some reasons that we might be worried about uh, their uh, ability to say detect French or something. One thing, if you pay attention to the transcripts I've posted, is these uh, huge AI models have just been exposed to so much text. Sometimes they just hallucinate meaning that they expect will be there. My favorite example, because the uh, AI model was trained on YouTube videos, is the, the, the transcript uh, a, ju a lawyer said, like it was saying in real life, uh, thank you for listening to me. And so the, transcri the transcriber said, thank you for listening uh, to me. Now please smash the like button and, and refer to all of your friends, <laughs> which is like, very common in YouTube. But like, you can see how a number of uh, assumptions that the AI makes could creep in and we need to figure out ways. And like, Lord knows there's lots of scary stuff on the internet, which the AI will just have seen. And if we rely on it uncritically, even in a seemingly like benign context like this, uh, we could be uh, introducing all sorts of error and problem into uh, our, uh, our research and practices. I look forward to our discussion and I look forward to the next paper. Thanks a lot, Simon. I like that line, hallucinating meaning. I think it's a good one. Um, Jenna McGill, Ottawa Law. Can I just grab the clicker? Thanks so much. Um, thanks. So it's a pleasure to be back at Con Cases and to be sharing this panel with Dash and Simon. Um, I'm here on behalf of myself and my co-author, uh, Professor Amy Salazin at U of O, to present um, some work that flows from our involvement on a project that's housed at the U of O Public Law Center on legal data science at the Supreme Court, and it's headed by um, Vanessa McDonnell and Chris Mamathan and Wolfgang Alschner, who I'm sure are familiar to lots of us here in the room. So I'm gonna zoom out from the technical specifics here about what analytics tools can do to instead focus on some of the broader normative questions that arise when we think about using these tools in the unique context of the Supreme Court. So um, I'm hoping to do three things in my brief time. I'm gonna start by just really generally sort of situating analytics at the Supreme Court. And then um, I'll ask you to come with me to imagine or envision three possible uses uh, of analytics tools in the Supreme Court context. And I'm gonna suggest 
that there are both benefits and risks to introducing analytics in the Supreme Court. And finally, I'm going to close uh, with some sort of forward-looking ideas uh, that I think are worth bearing in mind as these conversations evolve. Okay, so, um, oh no. In really broad strokes, when we're talking about analytics, as Dash and Simon have indicated, we're talking about using advanced technologies to analyze patterns in court data um, and to generate insights about judicial decision making or judicial behavior from those patterns. So most often, um, this kind of descriptive information is marketed as relevant to predicting the outcome of a case. So for example, one current commercially available tool uh, is advertised as helping lawyers quote, find and use the precise case law language your judge relies on to craft arguments that will ring true to your judge. And of course, the reliability or accuracy of an analytics output depends on lots of variables, including the quality of the tool itself, so whether it's going to smash the like button or not, um, as well as uh, the inputs that the tool receives, right, so the data that the analytics relies upon. In respect of that data, at the Supreme Court, we can imagine um, a few kinds of data inputs that might be relevant to analytics. So of course, the court's decisions, uh, and the Supreme Court is perhaps unique in the relative completeness of its electronically available decisions versus, for example, lower courts. Uh, factums of parties and interveners, audiovisual recordings um, uh, of oral arguments, and biographical information about the justices, which of course is publicly available to a, a decent extent. So if judicial analytics gathers that data and analyzes it and tells us something about a pattern or trend in a judge's decision making, why might we care about that? Like, how might that information be used? And this is really the sort of the question that motivates us in this project. So um, we point to sort of three potential use cases that we can imagine uh, where analytics could be influential. First, uh, we think that analytics could be relevant to the appointment of Supreme Court justices. Second, we envision that analytics outputs could be used by lawyers litigating cases before the Supreme Court. And finally, we imagine that analytics outputs could be useful in reflecting upon or assessing the Supreme Court's work. And that assessment might be intra the court, so like a self reflection for the court, or it might be an external assessment for uh, uh, by the public, for example. So I'm going to say um, a bit more about each of these three potential use cases now. Okay, so when we're thinking about the appointments process, an analytics tool might provide statistical information or pattern based summaries about a judge applicants past judicial or other adjudicatory work. Right, so this might include things like how appellate courts have treated an applicant's past decisions, um, ruling trends. So, you know, do they tend to favor crown or defense, for example? Um, and an analytics tool might even provide an evaluation of the writing style of a judge or the readability of a judge's decisions. Now, of course, this would only be directly relevant for judge applicants who have a history of judicial or adjudicatory work. So we're not talking here about sort of direct application for um, applicants from practice, for example, or from academia. But we can envision how access to this kind of information could be useful in the appointments process, right? Um, it could, for example, supplement impressionistic uh, or, or anecdotal accounts about how a judge behaves. Uh, it could support the sort of self-reported information that applicants currently give when they apply for a position on the Supreme Court. Uh, and these things would increase transparency in the appointments process and might provide a more complete or a deeper picture of um, uh, a judge applicant. However, there's my but, um, there are of course risks to inviting analytics into this space and I'll just highlight three here. So the first is that an analytics tool could generate bad information, either because the tool gets it wrong or because the data that it relies on is incomplete or erroneous in some other way. If this wrong or bad information ends up before uh, the committee, the selection committee, then we could have sort of a worthy applicant who's wrongly excluded from consideration on the basis of a bad judicial analytics output, especially to the extent that there might be um, a tendency to favor uh, what looks like an, an objective or an empirical measure like an analytics output over uh, something that looks you know, less 
hard. I'm using a lot of scare quotes here. Um, second, even if we have accurate or good outputs, those outputs can be misleading if they're not fully situated in the context within which judging occurs. So this is really important when we think about um, public engagement with analytics outputs in the Supreme Court appointments process. And we know that there is significant public interest in the appointment of Supreme Court judges. So for example, if an analytics report indicates that a judge applicant has been um, appealed at a very high rate for perhaps uh, compared to other judges of the same court or other judges at the same level, that statistic has to be understood within a broader appreciation of the appeals process, right? So including like the fact of as of right appeals and the fact that being appealed isn't evidence of like bad judging, right? Okay, finally, um, the rise of analytics certainly will facilitate increased scrutiny of judges, and there's a real risk here that analytics could be used in a disproportionately negative or even punitive way against Supreme Court applicants from equity-seeking communities. So there's lots of um, good data that proves that um, women and racialized applicants already face heightened scrutiny in the judicial nomination process in the US. Uh, likewise, here in Canada, that um, women and racialized um, candidates for public office face different and more media scrutiny than uh, differently situated candidates. And, you know, given Canada's unrealized but rhetorical quest for judicial diversity, the possibility that analytics could be weaponized against uh, equity seeking applicants is cause for real concern. Okay, our second potential use here uh, is the possibility that analytics will come to influence the way that cases are litigated before the Supreme Court. So this is sort of, you know, as lawyers maybe increasingly rely on predictive analytics as a way to gain strategic advantage, uh, that may change the nature of litigation before the court. Now, um, in our view, there's sort of a couple of preliminary challenges to the predictive value of analytics at the Supreme Court. Uh, the first flows from the fact that Supreme Court judges engage in group work in a way that is unique to that court, right? So they always sit in panel and their reasons for judgment, so their key outputs, right, often reflect various kinds of group work, some of which is visible and much of which is invisible, yeah? So to the extent that, um, you know, an analytics tool uh, uh, provides information about a single judge, the group work realities of the Supreme Court are, are inconsistent with, you know, for example, if you tailor your written or oral submissions to just one Supreme Court judge, that's kind of only going to take you so far, given the nature of the way that court works. Additionally, the court's status as an apex court is an additional uh, uh, barrier to the predictive value of analytics here. And that's because, you know, the court is empowered to strike new legal ground across like a huge breadth of subject areas. And so this mutes the value of being able to rely on past patterns to predict future outcomes. We can think of a few cases in the constitutional context where you know, a court sitting in 1993 has rendered one decision on a certain issue and then has come to render quite a different decision two decades later, right? Okay, now that said, like despite those barriers, we can see some narrower possible uses for analytics and litigation strategy. Um, Dash, who had to Dash, uh, uh, obviously mentioned, you know, how trends related to leave might be really relevant to making decisions about whether to seek leave. General information about what sorts of authorities um, or secondary sources a court tends to rely upon in a given subject area that might assist lawyers in deciding, you know, what sources to cite in their facta, for example. And finally, there, there might be some quasi evidentiary uses for analytics. So, for example, imagine that a lawyer attempts to bolster an argument about a legal error with analytics data showing that uh, trial judges in general approach a certain legal issue differently than the trial judge uh, uh, in the case before the court, the case under appeal. You'd be unsurprised to learn that we also have some risks um, uh, uh, in this context, as in the appointments context, the possibility of bad data, right, the specter of that sort of never goes away. But additionally here, although data from analytics could facilitate new arguments, there's also a real risk that relying on analytics, which are based entirely on what's happened in the past, could lead to the flattening of new legal developments, right? Because litigants come to interact with the court based primarily on what the court has done before. 
So um, there's a great American scholar, Charlotte Alexander, who uh, describes this in the following way. She says, computationally driven tools might reify previous patterns, lock out litigants whose claims are novel or boundary pushing, and shut down the innovative and flexible nature of common law reasoning. Additionally, um, you know, when we understand analytics as relying on and reasoning from past patterns, we have to be attentive to the reality of um, what Laura Weidinger calls value lock-in. So that because analytics are based on data that is point in time, you know, the decisions made by a court in a certain moment reflect the sort of existing values of that moment. Um, and so, you know, this sort of uh, pushes back against the popular notion that analytics are valuable because they're somehow objective or they're somehow value neutral, right? Um, I think we have to understand that that's, that's not in fact the case. All right, my final potential use case here is that patterns revealed by analytics might provide opportunities for more or better assessment of the court's work. So to the extent that an analytics tool might provide information about um, uh, voting alignment patterns between judges, uh, analysis of written reasons about the readability of those reasons. Um, and yesterday when I was traveling here, I read a really interesting paper uh, comparing the, the quantitative, oh no, okay. The quantitative <laughs> readability, thank you, um, of uh, decisions from various apex courts. And um, our Supreme Court here in Canada ranked third behind SCOTUS and the High Court of the UK. And interestingly, um, you know, again, lots of nuance and, and questions about, you know, how do we assess readability? What are the empirics of that? But uh, the most readable judge across all of these apex courts was Neil Gorsuch. Okay, so um, anyways, uh, so, so this kind of information, this kind of information, oh, and the, the last one, of course, patterns about judicial questioning. So many of you, I'm sure, will have seen uh, a recent example of this in the US where in response to a study, not unlike Simon's, that um, concluded that the female justices on SCOTUS were disproportionately interrupted by both their male colleagues and male lawyers, right? Chief Justice Roberts actually issued a change in practice such that now each justice um, has a set time to ask individual questions after each lawyer finishes their submissions. So this is a good example of the way that analytics could spark proactive reforms that improve process and procedure at the court, right? However, of course, there are important provisos here. First are the challenges of causal explanations. And this, again, like looms large when we think about introducing analytics, the science of analytics into the art of the law. So um, imagine, if you will, with me, an analytics output about which secondary sources the Supreme Court tends to rely on in a given subject area, right? Now, we know that the court citation practices depend in part on like which uh, sources are brought to the court by the lawyers. It also depends on like what sources exist, right? So if an analytics report shows that the court cites more academic journal, journal articles authored by um, uh, uh, academics using he, him pronouns versus academics using she, her pronouns, this doesn't necessarily or automatically lead to the conclusion that the court is biased against female academics, although that is where we want to go when we hear that, right? So you'd need to know, for example, the breakdown of topically relevant articles by author gender. Are they all equally available? Are some electronic, some are behind a paywall, some are only available in hard? Um, uh, and which of those articles were brought to the court's attention? Right. Similarly to Simon's excellent data set, I would ask, is it just that the female judges are more concise? So did they just ask better questions? And that's why we don't hear as many words from them. Uh, a final risk here is uh, is that of data overload, and I I, I don't I want to be mindful of the time. So data overload overload simply refers to um, this phenomenon where decision makers have access to so much information and they're so overwhelmed by it that it essentially impedes good decision making. So for individual judges, we can imagine that you know seeing information about their judging practices reflected back to them in an, from an analytics tool might subtly or not so subtly create pressure to conform, right? To create pressure to do what their colleagues are doing. Um, and this would quash diverse perspectives and jeopardize what Sherilyn Eiffel calls the structural impartiality that facilitates sound judicial decision-making uh, uh, that flows from a variety of perspectives. Okay, so looking forward, um, there's sort of four points here. I'm gonna focus on the third and fourth. We need, uh, you know, equal access to good quality data and in particular bulk data so that analytics tools can be well-trained. 
Um, analytics tools have to be high quality tools, right? I'm not the technical person in the mix here, uh, but you know, the tools themselves have to be based on sound statistical and algorithmic uh, uh, science. Importantly, I think maybe for this audience though, is the third piece, which is education. So even the most accurate data about the court really risks being misused or unfairly undermining public confidence in the court if it's misinterpreted, right? So this means that datical, data and statistical literacy has to be a key skill for justice system stakeholders going forward. And finally, and perhaps one of the most interesting things for me in doing this sort of little thought experiment is the way that although we're talking about new technology, when we think about new technology in the Supreme Court context, we return to really old questions about judges and judging. So like who makes a good Supreme Court judge, right? Um, are a judge's past decisions necessarily indicative of how they're gonna behave in the future? Like I wanna believe in a capacity for change and learning and better judgment making, right? I'm really done, okay. Um, <laughs> how much can we glean about judicial decision-making from written judgments? right? I don't know, there's some limits there. And when we collect information about the Supreme Court for the purposes of evaluation, what are our baselines? What are our criteria against which we're judging the patterns that an analytics tool might pump out for us, right? So that's sort of the risk of data in the air, like data is really sexy, we want more of it. But um, I guess my final plea here is just that, uh, you know, it's really important to conduct analytics with um, a clear purpose and with really careful attention to the sort of relevant normative questions that um, underpin uh, these technologies. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, uh, Jenna. I, I, I thought I'd just highlight an agreement between you and Dash on this point, like how incredibly important it is for lawyers to get the training to be able to critically assess mm -hmm. um, the outputs of these tools, right? Um, like you said, you know, they're often treated as neutral, often treated with deference, like it's hard science, but there's a lot of art mm -hmm. that goes into these systems. Mm -hmm even the most sophisticated kinds of predictive tech today that's gonna to be deployed in legal system, most often it's gonna be based on statistics. Stats that you learn in an intermediary stats course. Um, and there's a lot of art that goes into stats, model choice, data mm -hmm. training, testing, model feature, variable mm -hmm. choice and structure. These are ways that you can attack an algorithm might conclude that Neil Gorsuch mm -hmm. is the best you know, writer to, to be reading or a little bit of training you learn that smart contracts are actually kind of dumb. So uh, with, with that, um, we have a little bit of time um, to open up for questions, comments. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, we, uh, we want to have you on the, in perpetuity on the mic. Simon? <laughs> um, I don't think there's evidence that we're on that trajectory uh, right now. Uh, there, are, I mean, there are certainly people in the AI field who uh, like their ambition is to create a, a conscious entity. My analysis of the, the science is that that's just not the, the AI trajectory that we're on right now. Uh, and it, it, it's maybe very interesting marketing that so many of the firms which are talking a big game about AI and the future and creating consciousness uh, are the, and talk about safety and things are also the firms that stand to profit the most or are trying to raise the most capital. Um, so like the answer, I guess, is maybe, but probably not for the next six months. <laughs> Um, well, I guess for me, the, the, the question is so much like, can we, but I guess it, it is, it is your follow-up question, which is like, should we, right? Allow AI to do the work of judging. Um, I'm going to recommend a, a paper, um, by the late great Ian Kerr and Chris Mamathan called Justice John Roberts is a Robot, 
<clears throat> um, those of you who know Ian know that he was like light years ahead on thinking about all of this stuff and about the computational turn in law. And this is the exact question that professors Kerr and Mathen take up in this paper um, from both a sort of a philosophical and a legal perspective. Uh, so, you know, I, maybe I just, I have Luddite tendencies, I don't know, but I, I remain sort of committed to the idea that no matter how good the AI is, there is something very human about the work of judging that goes beyond the simple ability of like an AI brain to understand and process data, that there's something more emotive, there's something in the humanity of making decisions that are not just legal, but that are just, or maybe that are just and less legal, right? Like, I, I'm not sure that I want to give up all of those less tangible things to, to AI. So I'm going to go with no. Do we have time for another question? Anyone else? Right here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Gerard Kendi, University of Manitoba. Question about whether either of you have looked into on the specific question of um, number of words the Supreme Court judges spoke compared to number of separate questions they asked. Could you ask that? Because that might get back to the hypothesis that maybe the female judges are more concise. Um, I doubt that's the whole explanation, but it could very well be part of it. I know Justice Jamal, it could be he's on his first year there, but he has been known to like ask very few questions, but they get to the real mm -hmm. heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, once her Justice Cromwell, not known to be an interventionist judge, said he asked the party he was inclined to side against why he thought they were going to lose. So would would keeping constant the number of questions asked be a way to shed light on that issue. Yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's definitely possible. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question of where, of how far quantitative methods can take us before qualitative methods have to mm -hmm. take over. Um, like, what is a question? It's like, at a certain point, <laughs> it, like, almost hard to, it's hard to code. <laughs> Uh, in the same way, mm -hmm. like I'm interested in the question of like interruptions yeah. and how, yeah. from a computational perspective, do I write code yeah. that describes an interruption as opposed to, say, a conversation? It's, it's um, uh, like at a certain point, we do just have to hand things over to qualitative researchers. And I, maybe it's at that point. It is interesting. I'm thinking about there's, um, there's, uh, more work on this topic in the US. Uh, and I'm thinking about one study that that looked at questions and found a meaningful correlation between the party that received more questions was less likely to prevail at the United States Supreme Court. So, you know, those kinds of things, again, with the appropriate caveats and nuance and stuff, but you can see how that would be, um, well, I don't know, maybe it would just be depressing if you're counsel and you think like, oh, we got 34 questions, it's over. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, the, 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 the question of how to code those things, like what is a question? I mean, this is again, why we can't have AI judges because what is a question? That ephemeral stuff isn't subject, yeah. Nicholas. Oh, sorry, right here. Yeah, uh, well, Roxanne Parsa, I'm a staff lawyer at LEAF. Um, I guess this is a question for Simon. Um, I was, I don't know if this is, if there's as much research into this in Canada, but I know in the States, there's been some research into the amount of error that goes into um, transcription of racialized people, um, specifically there, they're not African-Americans. And I'm wondering here, especially in the context of bail hearings or in the immigration context, like detention hearings, whether you have any, any thoughts on that or have you looked into that at all? Because I think that would be a, a primary concern for me if we were to rely purely on automated transcriptions. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, a few things. So uh, the, we are pretty good at quantifying error uh, or we have, we have benchmarks, I should say, that can be consistently applied across languages. And the benchmarks that we have show that uh, the AI model, the transcription models are really good at English and Italian and Spanish and French, and it drops off. Uh, the reason it drops off probably is that human transcripts, uh, there are fewer of them once we're outside of those, those languages, uh, and maybe the quality of those transcripts drops off. It, you, it's interesting you bring up immigration detention. I, in my previous life, I was an immigration detention lawyer, and the IRB pays millions of dollars to transcribe every single immigration detention hearing. 
using uh, machine learning assisted human transcripts. And like, yeah, that's huge, huge problems. Uh, one of the promises of the uh, next generation of AI transcriptionist uh, uh, tools is that they'll be better than humans. The jury's out whether or not that'll uh, be the, the case or not. Go ahead, Nicholas. So I'm a three L at Osgood. I use they, them pronouns. Um, my question regards, I mean, most of what this panel has been talking about today is using AI to sort of quantitatively analyze and the qualitative so far has been left to the human brains in the room as opposed to the AI brains. And so as someone who approaches a lot of their judicial research by using quantitative um, analyzation uh, and to, to create qualitative models of things, for instance, what a particular um, ethical lens of a judge may be. Um, you know, how, how far is, is uh, the state of our AI in creating such a, su such a process to sort of analyze these decisions? Sorry, it's been a very long day. I haven't had enough coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope my question uh, is somewhat clarifying. <laughs> Um, yeah, like there are emotion AI models. Uh, I don't think they're very good for uh -huh. my experimentation. Uh, um, I mean, like a true believer data scientist, which I am not, but if there were a true believer data scientist here, they would say that everything is data and all data can be like, we just need to figure out ways to take any bit of information and be represented as data. And once we've done that, all data is the same and we can do anything with it. So a, a true believer would say like, we just got to figure it out, but it's definitely possible. Uh, I'm not a true believer. Me neither, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about like, um, there are AI tools, which I've only seen a little bit of, but that purport to have the ability to detect like emotion through tone. And of course, <clears throat> we can think of a million reasons why this is like a big problem, including, right, differences across race and culture and gender, like you name it. Um, what, like, I would be so interested, I'm quite sarcastic, and so I would be really interested to see what it thought about my tone, right? Sometimes it might think I'm quite mean when in fact I'm trying to be quite funny, successfully or otherwise. So, you know, um, I, like, I guess that's, that's one sort of foray in that direction. But again, it's like, I just want to ask, like, why? Like, why, why, why? Is, is this a good idea, right? Like, I think sometimes we want to forge ahead in these things because they seem exciting. Chat GPT can pass the bar, right? Like all these things. But sometimes we don't always take the sort of what I think are the requisite pauses to sort of ask, like, what problem are we solving here? Like, is this what, right? Like, what, 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 what's the context of this? Are we just gathering data for the sake of gathering data? Because I think there's really real risks around privacy and surveillance, at least, um, in that regard. It, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the, the closing gesture. We have like a very long tradition of being super on time here that I really just want to honor. So I'm going to just honor it. Absolutely. So <laughs> we'll have a round of applause for the section. Jamie Cameron actually used to have a little bell that she could ding at these moments. But you know, it, don't worry, we've relentlessly gathered data from everybody here. We'll be sending you out a set of uh, statistics to illustrate, you know, all the different ways that uh, what was said here today can be put through the mill. No, I'm just joking. We're on behalf of my um, uh, co-chairs over there, Ben and Emily. Uh, It's a real thrill to be back in person. We're very grateful for all the amazing staff support we had today. And we're very, very grateful for you guys for wanting to come out and spend the day in person. We are looking forward to next year. Your suggestions are always welcome. Papers will be coming out. And um, I encourage you to harass the presenters with your questions about their work.